um, yeah, so first of all, thanks to everyone for coming to my talk today. Um, I'm Zane, and I'm going to be speaking about excess leaks. Um, so yeah, let's get right into it. So I guess before we start, um, let me introduce myself. I'm studying computer science at Cambridge. I play CTFs um, with Water Peddler, which is part of Blue Water. Um, we were at DEF CON earlier this year. Um, previously, I was working with TikTok um, as a security engineer, um, and now I'm freelancing with ElectroVote and Cure53, which is a penetration testing company. Um, in my free time, which is very rare, I'm, I'm building Beko Slabs, which is a security training company. Um, yeah, so I guess the question that we can start with is, are we in a post-XSS world? So what do I mean by that? So it used to be the case that we could achieve XSS really easily because web frameworks just weren't secure. Like you could just echo untrusted user input in PHP and that could lead to an XSS because HTML output isn't sanitized. And similarly, there weren't really very good frameworks that people could use to sort of uh, manipulate client-side elements. And so people had to set inner HTML um, by themselves. And then that, and I mean, that, that just could lead to a lot of mistakes. Um, so DOM XSS, was, DOM XSS and, ref and basically reflect that XSS was just really common because um, just, just it, frameworks just weren't secure. Um, and then, well, frameworks become safer by default. So we have React, which um, you know you have your values of embedded expressions that get automatically escaped before being rendered. So um, it became like basically safe by default. Um, and well, the web standard as a whole also became safer. So we have things like content security policy to act as the last line of defense against XSS, and browsers also became smarter about MIME type sniffing. Um, so these are really good things because even if your application is coded insecurely, um, they can still save you from some attacks. And sure, there will always be quirks and bypasses in these sort of things. So for example, um, you could still inject JavaScript URLs um, if you have control over um, the href attribute of um, React components, and when someone clicks on it, that leads to an XSS as well. Um, and this is like more rare, but like this is very interesting. So if you can control the component properties of um, React components, then you could also easily achieve XSS by specifying custom HTML attributes. So for example, in, in this like very simple example, you're just getting um, whatever, uh, um, whatever attributes there are in the URL search parameters and um, basically expanding them out into the React component. And if you have arbitrary control over that, you could essentially just specify custom HTML attributes. So for example, here I'm just specifying a um, on-focus event handler. Um, well, but even, even so, um, as frameworks and standards evolve, it's inevitable that basically traditional XSS and CSRF are becoming more and more obsolete. So how do we sort of respond to that? So basically, uh, the idea of XSS leaks is that maybe we couldn't execute JavaScript, right? Maybe we couldn't perform a full account takeover or directly steal session data, but could we still somehow abuse legitimate browser APIs to sort of infer information about users in a meaningful way? And so this is the first example that I want to dig into. So basically, there might be a scenario where we might want to detect whether a specific URL results in a redirect. And why might we want to do that? So for example, um, some URLs might serve as search endpoints, right? And if a result is not found, it might redirect back to the main page where you started the search. And if the result was found, then it might not redirect. So it depends on how like, the application logic is coded, but basically, um, we, there might be a scenario where we, where we can leak some user state by detecting whether a redirect happens or not. So we could try to do this thing where sort of we open a new window from our website to a leaky endpoint um, on the target website where we want to detect whether it redirects or not. And we wait for a potential redirect to happen, right? Um, and so at this point, we might be thinking, so well, we could just try to read the history.length property of the window that we opened and well, in this case, the browser would stop us because browsers have become really good at sort of um, implementing these sort of cross-origin defenses. So we are attempting to read properties of a cross-origin site, so the browser would stop us. But there, there's like a really simple way to get around this. So you could just redirect the window back to your own attacker-controlled site, and now suddenly both windows are the same origin, and now suddenly you're able to read the property again. So basically, the history length would be three if um, in step three, the target endpoint that you want to test um, redirected. And so basically you have one redirect that, that was you redirecting the window to the target website, and then a second redirect by the target website, which you want to test for, and then a 
third redirect back to your own site. So that's three. And if it didn't redirect in step three, then you would just have two. You would just have a length of two, right? So this is a really simple technique, but it's really powerful. I mean, like I couldn't reveal which client this was, but basically this, this, basically this is the full POC and it allowed us to leak um, team members, device history, connections, etc., in a popular VPN service. Um, so this is like really powerful. Um, so let's dig into this. So we, we just showed that how we can detect like client side redirects, but there's a problem with this. So history.length is a JavaScript property. It can only track client side redirects. Um, it wouldn't work with server redirects. So there used to be this sort of technique where you could use the abuse, the maximum redirect limit of the fetch API to sort of detect whether um, a redirect happens, but there's a problem because the fetch API is subject to quite a few security restrictions. This only works for same site none cookies. So basically, if you have same site lex cookies, the fetch API wouldn't send the cookies in a cross origin request, and therefore you wouldn't be able to send any authenticated um, cookies, and you won't be able to leak any authenticated state. So, well, how do we get around this? So this is like a really interesting story because I was working on a completely unrelated CTF challenge when I came up with this idea. Um, and it led to a really interesting unintended solution. So the inspiration behind it was um, basically reading the Chromium documentation and seeing that, um, well, Chromium browsers limit URLs to a maximum length of 2MB. And so the natural question here is, well, what happens after 2MB? So we will explore that later. But basically, we know at this point that if we approach the 2MB limit, there might be an error condition that we might be able to detect. And so, we know that Chrome has a URL length limit, and at the same time, we also know that when handling server-side redirects, URL fragments are preserved. So what do we mean by that? So look at this, um, so basically we look at this um, red part of the URL, that's a URL fragment. Um, and basically when example.com redirects to a different website, um, the browser keeps the URL fragment in the address bar. So that part of the URL is preserved, even though the redirect didn't explicitly say that I want to redirect to this fragment, um, but it sort of preserves the state in the browser URL. Um, so basically, the idea is that we could construct a URL with a long fragment that essentially keeps the URL just under the length limit. Um, and so basically, you could just calculate um, how, many, like, how many characters you need in the fragment in order to keep it just under 2MB. And if a redirect causes the URL length to increase, um, then the total length of the URL now exceeds 2MB. And then... The Chromium browsers have this really interesting thing where they just sort of like just say, okay, I'm going to just render an about blank page um, because this is like too long for me to handle and I'm just going to um, say this is, this is a blank page. Um, well, otherwise, um, sort of if the, URL le if the URL length doesn't increase, then um, well, basically nothing happens, right? And like it's just business as usual. You just have the same site, uh, exact same page being rendered. Um, so this leads us to like sort of another like success and failure oracle, right? So if the basically if the URL stays under 2MB, then this would be rendering like as usual and you would have like basically a cross origin site. And when you try to read things like the Windows origin, um be, the browser will stop you. And if you but if this if the URL did increase in length, then you then because Chrome renders an about blank page, um, and because the browsers treat a blank page as being same origin as the original site, then well you could read the properties. So basically, um, you could detect whether a the success or failure condition kind of um, when uh, by detecting whether a JavaScript error is thrown. And so. This, these are just like two very simple examples, but the web is like really, really leaky. Um, and this is like some research that was done like two years ago now um, about they, basically they listed like all of the possible leaks. Um, so there is a problem with this though, because, fetch, because most of these leaks use fetch APIs and iframes, um, but because same site is now lags by default, we wouldn't be able to leak any authenticated user state. So now we get into this idea of same site leaks. So maybe we could take a step back and look at what is the problem that we are trying to solve here. So in many scenarios, we have HTML injection, but we couldn't get XSS due to sanitizers and CSP. So we could start thinking about whether we can try to leak the user state without any JavaScript. 
So the first example that, that is very interesting to me is um, what can iframes leak, right? So when I have a HTML injection, sometimes the first thing I think about is iframes, because naturally the question is, well, if we're embedding a cross-origin iframe that can run JavaScript, what can we leak from the parent side? So you have typical stuff like user agent, but these are not very exciting. Um, but it might be a surprise to you that if you just specify the allow equals the geolocation attribute, the iframe could access the user's geolocation. Um, and so because, so when the attacker site, which is in the iframe, tries to access the geolocation, it is actually the victim site that is asking for um, the permission. So crucially, when the prompt appears, it is not the attacker site that's asking for, for permission. And if the victim site has previously granted permission for geolocation, well, guess what? The attacker could just easily read it, um, which is like, that's insane. <laughs> um, but what else can you do with HTML injection? Well, you could consider a scenario where the leaky API sort of returns different status codes depending on whether a result was found. So maybe if the result was found, it returns a 200 status code. And if it's not found, then you get a 404, right? So something like that, right? I mean, this is a gross simplification, but basically just 200 and 404 status codes. So we could try to use this idea of nested objects. So the difference between sort of an object and an iframe is that when an object URL returns a 400 status code, oh sorry, 404 status code, it is actually not rendered by the browser. So even though it exists in the DOM tree, it does not exist in a GUI. So instead, the inner object is rendered instead. So if you have these sort of two nested objects, if the outer object returns a 404, the inner, the inner object is actually the one that's being rendered. So if we set our own server URL to the inner object, then we can detect whether a 404 was returned by checking if we received a callback. And so, well, this is interesting, but what if we had CSP that sort of blocks external objects? Um, we could try using a responsive images. So here we have an iframe that is at least 1,000 pixels wide when it is rendered, and we have specified an image source set that loads an image um, when the viewport is at least 1,000 pixels and a different image otherwise. So, well, you can see, sort of see what, <laughs> where we're getting at here, because um, if a 404 is uh, returned in the outer object, then basically the iframe would be rendered. And because the iframe has a width of 1,000 pixels, well, the responsive image matches the first media query and loads the first callback. So we can detect that a first callback was, was, being, was being requested by the browser. Um, and if we have a 200 status code, then the outer object is being rendered. The iframe is not rendered. Um, so the responsive image matches the second um, callback, and well, it loads the image from the second callback. So by detecting where, which one of these callbacks was being rendered, um, that we can detect whether it returned a 404 or a 200 status code. And if we just sort of expand this idea, um, we could sort of basically brute force, um, basically brute force characters or sort of search queries and see which one works and see which one returns a 200 status code. So. Yeah, that, that was like the, so basically that was the last example that I want to talk about. Um, so takeaways, so traditional XSS and CSRF are becoming increasingly obsolete. Um, XSS leaks abuse legitimate browser APIs to leak the user state through sort of success and failure oracles. And so one of the main problems with XSS leak techniques is, uh, uh, is like same site protections. Um, but we could sort of get around that by trying to weaponize HTML injections to achieve same site leaks um, if the, if the target site already has a HTML injection vulnerability. So yeah, that brings me to the end of the presentation. If you want to connect with me, there's a QR code. Um, slides for this talk is available at that link, and I'll be happy to take any questions.